Samuel 19. And Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all of his servants that they should kill David. That's a good way to celebrate 500 messages, huh? What do you think about that? Now the background to this is pretty simple. When you begin to study from 1 Samuel 16 forward, you have the call of David by the prophet Samuel, the least of the sons of Jesse being chosen and anointed, If you follow that same passage, you'll read on in the various chapters a little bit of David's victories as he kills the giant Goliath. And now the, I guess the whole thrust of these passages is where at first David stood in Saul's presence and loved him, Just a few chapters down the road, you see how something can change. And Saul wants to kill David. Wrapped up in jealousy as they heard every word Saul and his men went, the sound of Saul has slain his thousand and David is ten thousand. As if to say David is a much greater warrior than King Saul could ever be. And this went into Saul's heart, that coupled with an evil spirit, The spirit of the Lord, it says, departed from Saul, and an evil spirit came upon Saul. That was, by the way, sent from the Lord. So the backdrop of that, and if you combine some other interesting tidbits, uh, Saul says, you can have my daughter Micah for a hundred Philistine foreskins. That's a deal for you. (laughs) Wouldn't that go over well in today's society? And David went out and got twice as much. (laughs) Nothing like a go-getter. And he did. Except he didn't go get her, he got him. Anyway. (laughs) You had to be there for that one. So you get a little bit of the picture that David wants to please his Lord Saul. He wants to please the Lord, but he wants to please his Lord Saul. And Then there are certain things that come up in the 18th chapter. We read where it says, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him. That's in the 12th verse. And was departed from Saul. And then in the 29th verse of that same chapter, it says, and Saul was yet more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. So is this... What it means to be called of God, because that's a sure way to get people to want to come to the Lord, right? (laughs) But I think what registered with me is that through the years I've tried to say certain things to you, which perhaps if I'd have just read them out of the scriptures, it would have been more clear that people will often rationalize They will try to find a way to do something their way, especially if it's for God. They'll try to do it their way. And in Saul's case, we know that the Spirit of the Lord, the good Spirit of the Lord was removed and an evil spirit was sent upon him. Now, a very wise man used to say, the more mature the saint the tougher the test, the tougher the trip. Yes? Mm -hmm. And so silly me, I thought somehow things would get easier as time goes on. That's kind of silly, isn't it? Especially for you who've been around. You know, you succumb to the same thing. You think you've supported enough, you've prayed enough, you've tithed enough, that surely God will be a little bit more fair in his meeting out of your life situation and circumstance. Right? Okay, at least one person thinks that that is funny. Because I think it's very funny. And when I read the Bible, I find God has a great sense of humor. See, this is why I keep telling you, you have to put flesh and blood on this book. You must read this book, not like you read a newspaper or a magazine. You must read it to understand that God chose to reveal certain things to us in vignettes of these personages, biblical personages, for good reason. And if we take those lessons... We understand we are no different than these people. Think of this. Think of the justice and the the fairness of God. Well, he calls Abram out of his country, out of Ur-Chaldees, and tells him to depart 
his country and his kindred and says, and I'll bring you into a land. And that's all wonderful, except when he finally gets into that land, what does he encounter? Famine. Now, you would think God's going to call people out of their land, out of their comfort zone, to a land that is not only flowing with milk and honey, but you would certainly not think that would be very fair to, to make somebody displace themselves, go to a place, and now you're in famine. And I've taught a lesson on that. The blessings come through the famine. They don't come through the fat times. That's where you see God at work. That's where you see God's provision and his care. Now, you can look at the famine and say, thanks, God. Or you can look at the famine and say, thank you, Lord. Perspective. Maybe what the lesson was designed to do is teach that, yes, you left a fat life, a life of fatness and goodness, but I have something better for you. And in order to get you to that better life, you've got to pass through some famine. What about Moses? Same thing. God says, deliver my people, which eventually God will say are your people. <laughs> and you think God could be a little bit more fair and give him a more eloquent mouth? Or maybe, hey, the people were so grateful to be delivered, weren't they? Weren't they so grateful? Didn't they have a great spirit of gratitude? Okay, so half of you know the Bible. <laughs> because the other half who don't, all they did was complain. They were delivered out of Egypt's bondage, and all they did the whole time was complain, even though great miracles and great signs and amazing things, a demonstration that God was with Moses, but it was never enough. So when I say the fairness aspect, my question back to David in front of Saul regarding Saul speaking to Jonathan, his son, and all of his servants that they should kill David. The question is, what did David do to deserve this? Now, you can take away uh, from this message that you may have, you think you may have heard many times before, that somehow in the groove of things, God should do thus and so. But there are great lessons in what God was doing even in this. Now, if you read the rest of this, but Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David, and Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father seeketh to kill thee. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning. Abide in a secret place. Hide thyself. I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art. I will commune with my father of thee and see what I see. Whatever I find out, I'm going to let you know. Jonathan spake, Good of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee, to thee word, very good. And there's this kind of underlying thing. He says, For he did put his life in his hand. He, he put himself at risk. His life was endangered. Slew the Philistine. And the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it and did rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without cause? And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan and swear, probably with all fingers crossed, as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. Now that's the introduction for David to come back into Saul's presence. And I ask you this, how many times have you been in a situation where you knew the person was actually plotting something or doing something or just plain evil, but you didn't want to come out and be judgmental or say anything, and then you find yourself right back at the very same place that you swore you'd never get in before. Is that, I've had plenty of those experiences. I swore this would never happen again. In David's case, Jonathan called David, verse 7, Jonathan showed him all those things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. And that's how it happened. It's just that easy to say, Saul swore, and that's that. Now, you who know the Bible know that that swearing, whatever he swore, didn't mean anything, because he was determined to do what he was going to do, and that's that. You'll never 
This will never have any meaning to you whatsoever if you don't see the between the lines lessons. And many times, especially we who are studying the New Testament, we read about forgiveness, we read about what Jesus says about our enemies. So you, you might be like me and you might be inclined to say, well, the Lord will, will enter into this thing and somehow you end up back in the same position with the same people or persons. And then you just feel like you have been duped completely. So there's an interesting, there's probably about five or six interesting messages in between. Verse 8, and there was war again, and David went out, fought with the Philistines, slew them with a the great slaughter, and they fled from him. I mean, he's that frightening of a person. He's that powerful as a warrior. But he never probably anticipated that his greatest attack would come from Saul, even in spite of all that has happened as a backdrop. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul. And he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. And David played with his hand. He played the lie, played music. And Saul sought to smite David even into the wall with the javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence. He smote the javelin into the wall. David fled and escaped that night. Now, you know, you can very easily caricature this and think about it, but the reality is I see Saul sitting there festering, full of envy, full of jealousy, he cannot stand David. And the question is asked again, what did David do? He responded to the call of God. He slew the enemies that were supposedly the enemies of Saul and was a servant to Saul. What did he do to deserve this? Now, I said sometimes I should just read from the scriptures and not try and make a lesson before the scriptures are put out there because I can tell you that Anyone who is going to serve will come under a certain, when I say serve, serve the Lord in any capacity. You are going to encounter, even if it's a microcosm, some of these types of people. Now, in this particular instance, you might say, well, we don't, we don't have situations that bad. Oh, yes, we do. When you think about it, um, I, as your pastor for almost 10 years, have encountered more people who have that Saul evil spirit who have tried very, very hard. They've tried, and they'll keep trying. So I know if it happens to me on a larger scale, it happens to you on a smaller scale. Those are the people who you can't quite figure out. You don't want to be judgmental, but you can't quite figure out what their issues are with you. You know those people? They have issues with you. And if you really think about it long enough, you might, be, you might be asking the question, just as I asked about David, what did David do to deserve this? Now, on the surface, it doesn't seem like there's anything, but there are some deep issues here. Let's read on. Verse 11, Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. Nothing like some good old fellowship here. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. Michael let David down through a window. You think God would have something, some more glamorous escape route there than through a window. Quick, get out the window, go. And he went and fled and escaped. And the interesting thing in this is it says, Michael took an image, a teraphim, an idol, and laid it in the bed. That speaks volumes, by the way. She was an idol worshiper. She might have loved David, and maybe she was even interested in the God of Israel, but she was an idol worshiper. She took a teraphim, an idol, put it in the bed, put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster as, as his hair, and covered it with a cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. Oh, I cannot tell a lie. That's what, I've been around people that are like that. They, they, they're going to be as straight as an arrow when it's pertaining to something that God obviously doesn't frame upon here. She says, he's sick. I'm not saying that lying is, is uh, approved by God, but there are certain times when, obviously, it's recorded in here for a reason. We didn't need the, the little explanation. She's trying to save David. He's sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, bring him up to me in the bed. I still, every time I read that, I, I have to think about what exactly Saul envisioned. Like, did he envision they'd all like, Okay, 
and transport the bed <laughs> while he's there with the javelin. I don't know what, what he had in mind, but that's just a little bit weird. Bring him to me, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. And when the messengers would come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his hair, for his bolster. And Saul said unto Michael, why hast thou deceived me? Now, think of this. This guy is out to kill David. Why? He's concerned with the truth. Why hast thou deceived me? <laughs> That's why I said, you, you know, you can read this a hundred times or a thousand times and, and not grab the message, which is when people have this bent in their spirit, and I'm going to say it just like this, you can either be like David and, and be exposed to the trouble and the trial and the test, or I think you can choose an evil spirit. I know which one I would choose. If I was able to choose, I'd definitely take the trouble, the trial, and the test versus the evil spirit because the evil spirit doesn't even know that it's evil because he's busy asking his daughter, why did you, why'd you deceive me? And she spared her husband's life. Why did you deceive me? And sent mine enemy that he's escaped. He said, he said unto me, let me go. Why should I kill thee? So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt at Naoth. Now, David didn't ask to be put in this situation. He did indeed, we'll say, willingly walk into the act of marrying Saul's daughter. He did do that. Obviously, he went out and he got the foreskins to pay for it. But... He didn't ask to be put in the situation of being called and anointed of God. Samuel came to Jesse's house and went through all the sons, and the Lord was speaking to Samuel. It's not this one. It's not that one. It's not, you don't have any more sons? Yeah, there's one out in the field tending sheep. Go get him. And it was the youngest one, probably the least qualified, the least whatever of Jesse's sons chosen to be the future king of Israel. Did he ask for this? No. So when I say, how fair is this? There's a lot of times that if we're not careful to catch the lesson, we'll just get caught up in how unfair a circumstance is without seeing the larger lesson that God desires to work out for us. So I would say this. Um, if this is your first time listening to me, you might not grab the concept that as you mature in the Lord, and as you go, unlike the evangelists and all the popular Christian books, the more mature the saint, the tougher the test. The more you grow in the Lord, the greater the challenges you're going to face. Now, I'm, I feel very fortunate because you've already, for the most part, been taught that. And the very few that haven't heard it, I feel like I'm doing you a service to tell you this, to warn you that you're prepared. That's why we study God's Word, to know what to grab hold of when things happen, not in our flesh and not in our own way, but according to what God has revealed to us. You know, if you want to just self-help, then go out and help yourself. But if you're looking for God's way, God reveals it through his word. And, and there may be times, I think, that um, in saying the more mature the saint, you might be like me at times. I, I, I want to revert back to the more mature the saint, the tougher the test, never grow old. I want to just, I don't want to go there because it'd be much easier to just kind of stand still and then you wouldn't have to face a greater challenge ahead. But that's the way God's plan unfolds for us. I think it took me a long time to get this. Expect trouble. Expect things to happen. Expect the tests of life. Expect, it's like the person that said, I never expected to have a heart attack at 50. Expect that things will happen. Whether there are troubles brought on by yourself or troubles by another, it doesn't matter what the cause of the trouble is. Expect it. And then your attitude at least is prepared. You, you can't be, I'm sorry, you can't interpret my message and say, well, I'm expecting all the people to be like Debbie Downer. You know who she is, right? I can see like three of you that don't. Debbie Downer is the person that, you know, it's, it's sunny outside. Beautiful day. And if you meet up with her, she says, I, I heard it's going to rain. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I just listened to Dallas on TV, and he said, seven-day forecast, no rain. 
oh, it's going to rain somewhere. <laughs> That's that type of a person. There's never any silver lining. Even the rain isn't good. And it doesn't matter that it's not going to rain here. I'm, I'm not giving you those instructions. I'm just saying that you expect trouble and the handles that come with dealing with trouble, and you'll know how to deal with it. Now, I know what I'm going to say is absolutely right. You all heard my late husband preach out of Psalm 84. Blessed men go through valleys of weeping. Yes? Yeah. Mm. And the fact that they go through valleys of weeping, and they go through, right? How many of you, since the time that you first heard him preach that message, could have been 30 years ago, and you were told that valleys are part of the trip, but when you got in the valley, you were more like Gideon than the psalmist. Oh, how does happen? Where am I? <laughs> Even though you were prepared. Now imagine you poor folks who were given the preparation. And think about those poor folks that never were even given a chance. They weren't even told, expect a valley. They just were told, it's sunny and it's great. You who have been taught. I lived by Psalm 84. That's what carried me through some of the toughest times. But even I, this week, while I found myself in a, in a realm of a valley, concerning you, the church, with what I'd call a diminishing light, my first reaction wasn't what the psalmist of Psalm 84 says. It was a great lament. That same message that told us exactly that while in the valley, you'll find the devil comes out to beat you over the head with guilt for your mistakes or the mistakes that are assumed or presumed to be yours. And if the devil's not outwardly doing that, you'll help yourself to that because I, I, I did it. I did it this week. I, I was talking to somebody and I said, God must be displeased because I have such a sensitive soul towards this work, towards him. God must be displeased. And I began searching. What did I do? What did I not do? What did I say? It's not, that's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of sensitivity. But Satan only needs to hear or see that sensitivity come out to then turn around and use that as a club to beat you to death with your own guilt if you're guilty. And if you're not guilty to make you ask all the questions that produce a greater dimension of doubt, and doubt and fear do not come from the Lord. That's just the bottom line. So don't think I'm just preaching to you. I had to kind of go through this experience myself. Now in the big picture, I, I eventually came to my senses that sometimes things appear not fair, but they occur for a reason. And when the reason is not clear, our first instinct is to say, this is unfair. But when you can step back and see that there's a lesson in it, God's trying. He loves you that much that he sends trouble, not an evil spirit, and sends the trouble to show you something either about you or the people around you or your environment. And suddenly a light comes on. So what I'm saying to you is trouble is part of the equation. To, not to get happy about trouble, but to see trouble sometimes as a servant to bring us to a better understanding of something God sometimes would like to show us. And, and instead of being in the realm of trouble, which causes the syndrome of it's unfair and this is unjust, we start to see things a little bit differently. And that's what I want to share with you. Um, for the Christian worker... And let me address some of my brothers and sisters who are servants, ministers, and pastors. The pressure of ministry and the work of the ministry and the criticism. I can think of two people right off the top of my head that are highly, they're dear friends, they're servants in the Lord, and they're, they're highly criticized because they're both females. And I've said this before. If God could use a donkey... And there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of talking donkeys on TV. <laughs> but if God could use a donkey, Balaam's ass, I don't think he's going to be too bothered about gender. 
get over it. While the whole world is busy fighting about gay and lesbian rights and all these other rights out there, why should the people inside the church be the, um, the people just stand back and say, well, you know, this is an antiquated mindset that lived in the dark ages when women were second-class citizens. So I speak to some of those fellow workers in the Lord, the pressure, the criticism, the financial burdens that you have to worry about. These are all troubling matters. You know, some of, some of the people sitting in the church, you don't think of those things. You think of your own needs. You don't think of the pressure of the person who is leading the church. And the pressure comes in a diversity of forms. I, I think sometimes, for the most part, I have managed that pressure by running to God and going to God and seeking God. But the pressure can be incredible. And then there's, we'll call it the Christian workers, you who are volunteers, you are the, the ones that are doing all of the things to keep everything going. And you fall under the same thing. There's pressure, criticism. You know, pressure is because maybe you desire to do more and you can't. Or pressure from your friends and family, why are you doing that? Criticism follows with, why are you doing that? It's, it's usually always family people that come to that same criticism. Well, that's not church. Where are their icons? Where is the statue of Christ? Where, where is the communion banner? I mean, whatever they're going to criticize, they're going to criticize it. It's not spiritual enough. It should be this versus the very thing that I've tried to say. My job is to bring the scriptures alive, to make them have an application, to put flesh and blood on them that, as McGee used to say, where the rubber meets the road, you have something to go on, on this journey. Otherwise, it's, it's a pretty miserable existence. If you have to self-help yourself, and there's no greater power to help you, we are pretty miserable. We're just a bunch of creatures on our own, doing our own thing. And as I said, if God's not in it, I don't want to be a part of it. So, the lesson for the minister, for the Christian workers, and you bring that right down to people who are pressure, criticism, the same things on a personal level, your personal, your home life, your family. You, you, there's several layers of these as you bring them down. You realize that no one who commits their way to serve will be immune from this. Now, of all the categories I just named, Christian worker, pastor, helpers, the work, the committed ones, the volunteers, is there anybody that is listening to me, except for maybe a few new people that can't say, that's my experience, the pressure, the criticism, the things that I have to contend with, whether they're financial burdens or financial pressures or my family is on my back all the time about the church and about my... Is there anybody that, that doesn't meet those criteria, that hasn't had an assault in one way or another from somebody you know meeting those criteria? Because I think that pretty much covers most of us. Yes? yes. <laughs> that was overwhelming. So... What I'm saying to you is you can't let the circumstances of trouble and of trials and of testing break or sever your commitment. Now, we're not in the exact predicament as David was with Saul. But if you think about it this way, that's why I said you need to sometimes approach the Bible in multiple levels. If you think about it this way, Saul sought to kill David. Many people who are in the way, in your way. They're not in the way as in in the way of the church. They're in the way. <laughs> they seek to unplug you spiritually. And that's the same thing as Saul. In a different realm, Saul tried to kill David. Remember what Jesus said, don't worry about what they can do to the body, but worry about what they can do to the soul. In the New Testament frame, many people will have the same mindset. It's the same spirit that tries to get you derailed from what God has called you to do. Now, I just, I finished telling somebody last week, this is a pretty big planet, and there are lots of people needing to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I meet people who live in such a small little bubble that they think because they have, they have their church over here and there's a church across the street or a church down the road that they have to stake their territory and they become very territorial about who they're going to win to the Lord. It's a big planet with a lot of lost people on it who are in darkness. 
wake up to the fact that God called you to be a sharer of the word and a light, not a club. And then that changes your perspective. So for us today, we're going to take a page out of what we might say is a standard lesson here, our expectancy of what God will do when we are in trouble, and the answer to that is found in Psalm 59. You old-timers were already spinning the pages there. I saw you. But don't think you've seen it or heard it or know it all, even if you have look interested. Now, one person back there looks interested. Now, I want you to see something. You know, I've, I, we've camped out here many a time, but I want you to pay close attention to what happens here. You notice that David doesn't start this psalm with anything but the first word you read in your King James is what? Deliver me. Deliver me. Now, I, as your pastor, still, I still need this lesson. So I know if I still need it, you still need it. Because the tendency is when trouble comes, and trouble will come, and it may not be as large as Saul trying to annihilate David, but trouble comes in whatever manner and whatever method it comes to you, trouble will come, and it will come. That you don't make your first go the flesh. Remember Isaiah 50? Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust, let him stay in the name of his God. But... How many times does trouble come, and even though you know that lesson so well, your first instinct is to go and reach for the matchbox because it's, it's like phone a friend. It's like that uh, millionaire program. You know, you phone a friend first. You don't talk to God. You phone a friend. That's your lifeline right there. You're never going to believe what happened to me. <laughs> it's so much easier to phone a friend than it is to sit down and talk to God, right? Because that's a real person listening to you. That tells you how warped our understanding is of our relationship with God. So first words of David, deliver me from mine enemies. Then he goes on to say, deliver me from the workers of iniquity. And a few other words that have the same woven in fabric here. Save me from bloody men. He says, for lo, they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression, not for my sin. He's saying here, this isn't to say David thought he never sinned, but here he's saying, I've done nothing wrong. That's what these verses mean. I've done nothing wrong. They're, they're, the mighty are gathered against me. In fact, this is, uh, if you have a Bible like mine with a heading like mine, it says, to the chief musician, Michtam of David when Saul sent and they watched the house to kill him. So these mighty are gathered against me. I've done nothing. In this case, I want the lesson to apply that whether you've done nothing or whether you've done something, the outcome, how you deal with the trouble, the trouble's going to come. And don't tell me you don't need this message because I know you need this message because I need this message. And if I need this message, you need this message. And I've, you know, I've played this over in my mind. I've done nothing wrong. Why do these people set themselves against me? Why do people do this thing? They run and prepare themselves without my fault. And he says, awake to help me. And behold, thou therefore, Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressor. Selah. I want you to see something. He has several names of God that he's kind of pulling out of the, the whole repertoire here. Lord God of hosts, that's the fighting forces, the uh, Lord that calls into action animate and inanimate objects, the God of Israel who is the keeper and creator of his people. Uh, there's another reference to the God of mercy, which is actually the God of steadfast love or unfailing love. Another reference in this psalm is our Lord, O Lord, our shield, which is a, a defense and God is my defense, as in a fortress or a high tower. Essentially, of all the things that David is saying, he's saying nothing less than all your resources, Lord, will do in this moment. He's not saying 
I have an idea. He's saying nothing, nothing else but your resources. You order everything. You are in charge. Your sovereign power, your strength, nothing less than all of your resources will do. I don't know why that that seems to be such a problem for people to come to God and say, I need your resources because I don't have any. Why is that so difficult? Because we'd like to still say that we can still fix something just a little bit. They are all needed, all of these names, all needed, all these are needed in this time, in this hour. And the backdrop of what we've just read tells you something, a little insight about David. Now listen to what he also says. They return at evening, they make a noise like a dog, they go around about the city. Behold, they belch out with their mouth, swords are in their lips. For who say they doth hear? But thou, O Lord, shall laugh at them. Thou shalt have the heathen in derision. You remember what I once said? When the Lord laughs, it ain't going to be funny. <laughs> remember I told you that in another lesson out of another psalm. When the Lord laughs, it's not going to be funny. Well, that's what basically he's saying here. Let me read through the psalm. Because of his strength will I wait upon thee, for God is my defense. The God of my mercy shall prevent me. God shall let me see my desires upon mine enemies. Now, he first says, wipe him out. Or maybe I have it in reverse order. I need to look at my Hebrew here because that will help me remember the order here. He first says in one place, wipe him out. And in another place, he says, don't wipe him out. It's like you change. You know, we do that, though. How many of you have done that? Oh, Lord, I, I pray for my enemies. You know, they've been, oh, God, just go get them. <laughs> yeah? Uh, somebody in the back. Amen. Amen, sister. That's what I'm saying. Well, that's what's being said right here. Because you think about it, he changes his mind. One place he says, he says, wipe them out. And the other place he says, here, it's in verse 13, consume them in wrath. Consume them that they may not be. And I had to write it somewhere in one of my margins here that they're going to, till they are no more. I wipe them out right off the map. And he says, no, no, wipe them out. Change my mind. <laughs> It happens to the best of us. Slay them not, verse 11. Lest my people forget, scatter them by thy power. Bring them down, O Lord, our shield. There's another reference there. For the sin of their mouth and their words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride and for cursing and lying which they speak. Consume them in wrath. Consume them. Just wipe them out. And let them know that God ruleth in Jacob under the ends of the earth. Selah, think of that. And at evening, let them return and let them make a noise like a dog and around, go around about the city. Let them wander up and down for meat and grudge if they be not satisfied. Really, the Hebrew says and growl or bark. It's interesting. And then verse 16, but I will sing of the power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. Unto thee, my strength will I sing, for God is my defense and the God of my mercy. Now, I want to I do a couple of things here. The first thing I want to say is that if you read carefully, and I'm not going to do a whole translation, I'm just going to do a few lines, but if you did a whole translation, you'd find out what David is saying is, these enemies are not just my enemies, God. They're your enemies. Now, to somebody who doesn't understand an Old Testament perspective carried into the New Testament. There were people in the New Testament who were enemies. And Paul says he turned such and such a one over, committed him because there was nothing to do. He, this, this coppersmith did him much evil, and this other one. So there's, there are many examples in the New Testament of people who just, it's like you have to just leave them alone, just commit them over that way and Quit trying to fuss over it. So don't think that this is just some Old Testament strange thing. And then there's always the possibility, like in the New Testament, where you encounter a person who was aggravating the cause of God, who was doing all kinds of things to God's people, and God decided in his mercy to turn that person around. I'm speaking about Saul, Paul, who became a powerful mouthpiece for God. So 
you know, careful, deal carefully when you ask God to do something like this and recognize in the setting what it, what it might mean. Now, for us, there are a few highlights. The first highlight for me in this psalm is this. In verse 9, and I need to do verse 9 and verse 17 together because um, my late husband did a translation of this and I do not know that um, when he did his translation, he, he did his own thing. I'm going to show you what the Hebrew actually says. And you, as I've always said, after I'm done, you can make your own decisions. I don't desire to try and persuade people about right and wrong and so forth. So the Psalms were written in Hebrew. And I'm writing, this is verse 9. Shemara, Shemara, there we go. That is verse 9. And verse 17, so we can see the difference between the two, just a little difference. Um, here we have Uzo, and in verse 17, and this is a uh, terrible looking Ayin, so I'm trying to make it look prettier for you, but there's no hope for that letter in the Hebrew. Leave it alone. Some of you who studied Hebrew with me know it's just an ugly letter. All right, here we go. So, in verse 9, let me get another color. Your King James has italics. Italics were added by the translators because they could not make an adequate or good flowing uh, translation. And it's, this is an interesting one. So we have the Hebrew word ooz, and this is him. Him, bo, or vo, is, so we have strength, strength, his strength, this could even be his, let's put that like that, him or his, um, and to thee or unto thee, to thee or unto Iloke, uh, and then this word here, which is kind of interesting because in the middle of it, shomer, is the word to watch or to watch or to keep. To watch, to protect, to keep. So down here, we have in verse 17, because I'd like to show you, because there's been so many messages on this, I want to make sure it's clear in your mind, that this is my, and ooz, my strength. So if you want to make the notes, you may have notes from Dr. Scott. I'm showing you what the Hebrew says. You can go and look it up for yourself in the Hebrew. You who study Hebrew, I know that you will take my word, but some who are hardheads will say, well, I've got this in my Bible. Well, I don't know what to tell you. Just deal, just Deal with it, okay? <laughs> All right, thank you. I love the person back there who laughed. I love you so much. All right. <laughs> All right, so I want you to see the difference, the subtlety between the words, because that's what made it so problematic. But when we settle out these words, it'll make more sense to you that in verse 9 where it says, uh, because of his strength will I wait upon thee, we, we should read it as if to say, because we, you recognize that is his, his or him. So, unto thee, sometimes the translators will add strength. Unto thee, his strength, what does your King James say? Wait upon thee. So, unto thee, his strength, I will watch or wait for. You know, this word is used... This particular word, shomers, used in Psalm 121 where it talks about the Lord who watches over Israel. It is that protective governing power. So here, essentially, the psalmist is saying that he will be watching, looking out for, if you will, uh, the strength of God. But careful, because verse 17 says, this, it reads virtually almost the same thing, unto thee, but they did it right here in verse 17. My strength, right? My strength. So something interesting happened in the translation. 
And the only point I want to make to you is that in the midst of his trouble, and in the midst of this, there, there's a few things that come real quickly. Quickly, One of them is that whether you, however you're going to translate this, it's very clear that it is his strength that is given to us. And then to kind of put a capstone on this, he calls this particular strength now my strength, even though we know that the my strength he's referring to comes from the Lord. So these two verses, looked at very carefully, tell us a couple of things, that in the midst of all of this, it's, this is kind of the, the neat way of, to say this, he prayed himself out of trouble and into triumph. And he goes from trouble to triumph, and no change of circumstance, no change of situation, and this psalm of deliverance becomes a reality that in the closing verses, what is not seen clearly becomes more evident. I'd like you to look at three words that occur in verses 16 and 17. They all look the same in the English, but I will sing of thy power. By the way, I will sing of thy power. It's the same ooze word. I will sing of thy power, of thy strength. I will sing aloud, and then unto thee, my strength, I will sing. Three different Hebrew words. The first word that I highlight as I will sing is I will sing a joyous, triumphant song. I will sing a joy, joyous, triumphant song of your strength. Why? Because David realized my strength comes, that's, he is my strength. I will sing a joyous, triumphant song, that's one, this, or, or thy power. The second one, I will sing aloud, is from the Hebrew root, ranan, which does not always have a pejorative, negative, um, it cannot always be translated as murmured. In this, in this case, it is a, a cry, a proclamation a piercing proclamation. I will proclaim aloud of thy mercy in the morning. And what exactly should that mean to you and to me? It means that David knew there'd be another day. I'm going to say that again. I will proclaim, I will sing with loud proclamation of thy mercy. And I'll come back to that word mercy in the morning. In other words, there's going to be another day. The sun is going to come up and I'm going to see it. You know, I know you've all had days like this because I've had days like this where it's so bad you just want to pull the covers over your head. A spirit of fatigue. You ever have that spirit of tiredness comes upon you? And, oh, God, I've got to go lay down. <laughs> I need more coffee. Yeah? yeah? What I love about this is it doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter what is going on. He says, I am going to sing a loud proclamation of thy mercy in the morning. There will be a tomorrow. There's not going to be trouble all the way through. And even if trouble is there and it doesn't change, I'm looking to him, my strength, and I know I'm going to make it. There's going to be a morning for me. And then the last one, the last word for sing, unto thee, my strength, I will sing. That is the Hebrew word zamar, to make music, to praise God. So he uses three different words to tell about his expression towards God. You don't see that in the English. And there's one other thing you don't see, which brings me to kind of bring this to a close. <clears throat> it's the word that appears three times in this psalm, mercy, mercy, mercy. Verse 10, verse 16, and verse 17. I've told you many times, I study Hebrew, I love languages. If I could have the confidence that people wouldn't get fascinated by this and they would learn the deeper lessons, believe me, I'm like, you can't stop me. Between history and language, I'm a happy camper. Don't get me wrong, but you know, I've taught these many times, and I don't think, I think a lot of people just, oh yeah, we've seen that. Chesed is the word being translated in English mercy, but this Hebrew word is unfailing love, unconditional, unfailing love. And there's something so profound that it's, it's, it's messed up by the fact that they use mercy, the God of my mercy, the God of 
of my unfailing love, not my unfailing love, but his unfailing love makes me say, the God of my unfailing love, I will sing aloud of thy unfailing love in the morning. And lastly, the God of my mercy, the God of love. And then you begin to kind of step away from this and you realize, of course he's my strength. Can you see the confidence growing in David? Of course he's my strength. And then you look at this man and you think to yourself, he learned a lesson in there that unfortunately our language kind of covers up. That in trouble and in this chaotic time and in this prayer of deliverance, he learned about God's love to him. And that's why I said sometimes you get into trouble and you don't realize that God is busy trying to show you his love and his care. Now let me describe some of you, not all of you, but some of you. You are like, you ever go down to sea in Long Beach, the ships coming in, the cargo ships coming in with their loads? You ever seen them? Being, they have these special machines to unload all the containers. Some of you remind me of those cargo ships you are coming in so bogged down and so heavy, you're barely floating, and you can take that however you want. <laughs> and you come in, and you, you've waited about five minutes, and no one has come to unload the cargo. So you take off again, just as burdened as when you came in. And the lesson there is kind of manifold. It says, one, we are to cast our cares upon him, and some of you remind me of those that have already taken off. You didn't wait long enough for an answer to your prayer. You didn't wait, watch, expect. And as you left, the great dock master appeared. You couldn't see him because you were already turned away and headed about your business. And his lament was, I was on my way. Couldn't you have waited another minute? We rush in with our troubles and we don't want to seize upon these words and then take them to prayer. And you watch, like David, in a microcosm, he goes from this torment and trouble, my enemies, my focus is on these people, and they're out to get me suddenly. I'm going to sing joy, I'm going to sing praise, and I'm going to do it in the morning, which means tomorrow. <clears throat> tomorrow, I will sing. I won't cry, but I think I'm <clears throat> right now. <clears throat> I will sing tomorrow. And if that's not enough, I know that God loves me. He let me see his love in this terrible situation. Now, if you take these lessons, you take this psalm, and you think about this. Before David had a fortified palace to live in, which eventually he did, he said, the Lord is my fortress. Before he had an army of men which looked like a straggly band, he said, the Lord of hosts essentially is with me. In other words, if we quit looking at what will yet, what is yet to come, or what might be, and what we already have, we see the Lord's strength sufficient to lead us through. And what's the last thing that I'd like to say? As I said, trouble will come, and it will come, I guarantee you. I don't know, I don't want to even try and figure out what your trouble is. I just know that trouble comes. And when it comes we're able to look at these passages and recognize I may not have the solution in terms of solving the problem to take away the trouble. But after I have been laid out flat from the pressure, the criticism, the torment, whatever's going on, I do recognize one thing, and the thing I recognize is his strength leads me through. His strength is sufficient. It's enough to get me through. It's not only enough to get me through, it's as if what David is saying here is the Lord already won the battle. Why? Because I'm going to sing in the morning. Not my strength, as in my strength, 
but his strength that then becomes mine, he gives it to me. And when that is clear, no matter what trouble comes, and trouble, as I said, will, you'll make it. Now, maybe you don't have the same exact type of troubles, and I don't know. I can't say what the final stretch of 2014 is going to be for you or what 2015 is going to bring. You can, there are a certain amount of things you can, you can know for sure. Whether you like it or not, you can say, well, at least she prepared me for this. She gave me a faith handle to grab onto. Trouble's going to come. Now, I'm not the voice of doom. I'm the voice saying, if you are prepared and you know what to do and the, the place to grab hold of in God's word, that when trouble comes, you are not too shaken. And even if you are, like I said, oh, I know the Psalm 84, blessed men go through valleys of weeping. <gasps> what was that? you'll at least have this lesson in your mind. Nothing comes into your life, any trouble or any trial, that the strength that you possess isn't enough to overcome. So, you know, when you look at your trouble and you look at it dead on, recognize one thing. In the flesh and in the carnal way, it may be quite gargantuan in stature, but it cannot reach the height, the strength, the width, or the depth of God's strength provided to the saints who will grab hold of it. And that is the strength that gets us through. That is why we can say we do have victory over the enemy. Whatever that enemy looks like, trouble, the devil, whatever you want to call the enemy, we have that victory. Why? Because we have his strength. We don't have to try and do it on our own. And when you understand that, we are then more than conquerors. That is the message I want you to leave here with today. Come on up. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch Listen and learn 24 hours a day. Simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.